Good to see you today. What a beautiful day it is out there. Amen. Praise God. Great day. Great, great time, Lord. Great worship time. Glad that you're here today. Sometimes it tends to say when it's just beautiful, folks kind of have to sneak out, but I'm glad you snuck in today. Amen. We're talking about grace today, but before I get into that message on amazing grace and what's so amazing about grace, uh, let me just share with you a little bit. Most of you are aware of the fact we were down in Belize this last week with our pastor's conference. This is the 11th conference we've done down there. Amen. Yeah, that's a, it's been a real praise the Lord. It's been a real strengthening force and a real strengthening factor for the churches, the Baptist churches down there. Uh, this conference is hosted specifically and uniquely for them. We pay their way to come, basically, by giving them the stipend help of their expenses. We pay for their hotel rooms for two nights, their meals while they're there. Uh, your gifts, your prayers, you make it all possible. And it's, it's, the conference in, in, in Belize is always unique. Many of you have been to Belize with us on those trips down there. And you know that one of the, the struggles there is just the heaviness. And the, there's such a, a spirit of despair in so many people's hearts and lives. And many times that carries over into the pastor's conference even. You just, they're sitting there and it feels like this heavy cloud. But praise God, God broke through that. We just right off the bat, it seemed like God just started doing something. We had our first meeting on a Thursday night and God just came in great grace and blessing and just a lot of liberty took place. Uh, it was a great time of the Lord. We, we had some tremendous responses from the people that were there. The worship times were, were led by the, some of the local pastors there. So we had great praise and worship time. We also had some teaching times with the men, teaching times with the women that took place. Uh, at one point in time, when in the midst of everything was really stirring, James Darby, one of the pastors that I took to some of the conferences, uh, had everybody in the room. We had a prayer time for them. And in fact, Sister Kathy got up and prayed over the pastors and over their wives especially. And it was just a real unique blessed time as they gathered. The pastor's wives did a couple of conferences just for themselves. And I spoke to the men at a couple of conferences just for them as well. So I think we had like eight or nine sessions in all, but they were just times of great, great anointing and great blessing. And uh, again, I thank you for all you do to make that possible. I can't tell you, I wish I could kind of bottle that, you know, what the pastors tell me and the experience they have and present it to you and say, here's what God did and kind of pour it out so you can smell it and see it and, you know, and taste it on some level. But uh, you'll never know, you know, what, what that means to these guys. Some of these guys, it takes them six to eight hours to get there. They come by local buses from little villages that stop in every little village on the way. Some of them hitchhike. You know, it's, 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 an amazing, it's an amazing ministry experience. So appreciate all you do to make that possible. And all the Lord does while we're there and making it possible. We were asked again back for our 2016 mission trip to come down to Dangriga. So we're looking at that possibility. Those who want to go on a mission trip in 2016, probably be in June sometimes what we're looking at. So uh, start praying about that and come on, be a part of it. It's always exciting what God does. A high school there in Dangriga has a new auditorium. So we're going to consecrate it and and do a crusade there in the auditorium. And uh, you don't see many high schools down there with auditoriums. You know, a lot of times auditorium means let's meet outside in the playground. And you have your meeting out there. But uh, so it would be a covered place with fans and everything. It's amazing. So uh, be praying about going on that trip with us. We'll be, of course, be taking young people as well as adults and doing a lot of ministry work. So be praying for that as we go forward. Hey, as we get into the message today, I, want to do, I do want to talk about grace and, and how amazing grace is. And as we sing that song and, and talk about the grace of God, you have to understand that everything you are and everything you ever will be is due to the grace of God. But if there's one thing that I think is extremely misunderstood in the church today is this whole context and the concept of just what grace is. I mean, a lot of people say, well, I'm under grace. And to them, that means one thing. Some people think I'm under grace. So I can go live like the devil. Some people think I'm under grace. So I have to work harder on and on it goes. So let's see if today, if we can give a, <clears throat> an accurate definition of what grace is and get a fresh grip on what that means in our life and what, what will be as a result of our experience of walking in the grace of God. Obviously, for those who've been around this church at any length of time, you know we are saved by grace, grace through faith, right? It's salvation that comes as, a, as, as God demonstrates his mercy in our life and delivers us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Ephesians 2 is that passage and well, it's not going to work for me today, so I'll let you put it in PowerPoint and work it from there, okay? But anyway, in Ephesians 2, we have that, that anthem verse, by grace you're saved through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. All right, it's all grace. And so what, you ask people, well, what does that mean? And the term like this comes out. Well, it means that I didn't deserve to be saved and God saved me. Well, we put it this way. What I learned in Sunday school is it's unmerited favor. How many of you have heard that definition? Unmerited favor. Okay, what's that mean? 
I mean, really, what's that mean? Well, I don't deserve, that's unmerited, I guess, we, I, didn't, I didn't merit it, I didn't deserve it. Unmerited, but what does favor mean? I don't know, I guess it means, you know, blessing. Well, it has to do this very, very concept of what grace is. When the Holy Spirit convicted you, if you, if you are a Christian, all right, it starts with a conviction process from the Word of God, the Holy Spirit takes the Word of God, and that Word is a, it starts dealing with your heart, and you start realizing, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm lost. I need Jesus in my life. I need to be saved. Now, the Holy Spirit brings that further to, he influences your heart, right? The Holy Spirit begins to influence your heart and call it conviction, call it whatever you want. But then it brings this place of brokenness and repentance where you literally understand that you don't deserve it and you need to turn your life over to God and you make that decision to return to him and turn to your heart to him in faith and you choose at this point to follow him unmerited favor, but understand that working process of the conviction of the Holy Spirit, the understanding of the truth of God's word, the compelling move of your heart to move in that direction, all that's grace. All that work is grace. It, it's, 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 a, it's a power word in scripture. So we're saved by grace. But when I was translated from the kingdom of darkness, put in the kingdom of light, yes, that's grace, all right? When, my, when the application of the blood of Jesus is placed upon my heart and my sins are forgiven, what, what, what is that process? That's grace, all right? The opening of my eyes to understand the truth of God's word, that's grace. The conviction in my heart that I need to have a change to repent, that's grace. The ability, catch this, the ability to repent. I can't repent, Bible, why, why can't I can't repent? Because I'm a dead man. Dead men can't do anything. So God has to do something. He gives me the ability to repent. That's grace. You get a little more idea of what it means now, not just God overlooking something. You know, I'm a sinner and God overlooks my sin and receives. No, it's the action, it's the power, it's the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And God gives us that. What happens is the word's exposed to us and we believe what is written in the scripture. Well, it's going to work for me, but... Can't see if you can follow. First John 5 says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. You chose to believe what grace did in revealing truth by the Holy Spirit to you, and you moved and you made that decision. And now where's my confidence? My confidence is in God's grace as it's revealed in God's Word. The second thing about grace, we don't just have grace for salvation. We have grace for serving, for living for Jesus. It's that unmerited favor in one place, you might say, in this condition where it's grace for serving, it's unmerited strength. There's a lot of people say, you know, I understand what the Bible says and I, I want to trust Jesus and I don't want to go to hell. Anybody here want to go to hell today? No, don't want to go to hell. So uh, I'll pray the prayer. Lord Jesus, forgive me all my sins. I sinned against you. Give me my heart. I want to lift you. In Jesus' name, amen, I'm saved. But yet they never live for Jesus. What happened? They missed the grace of God. That power of God to work in the heart, that action of the Holy Spirit, that, that moving and prompting, they just left off that and they responded in a moment, but Jesus said it's like seeds that spring up for a moment and then they disappear. You know, the flower just fades away and it doesn't, it doesn't, you can't stand the heat of the tribulation of the day. So it's kind of this, it's a pseudo grace. But what real grace does, it gives you the power to literally serve the Lord. Second Timothy, Paul writing to him and he says in two, chapter two, verse one, therefore, Timothy, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. What's that mean? Well, let's get back to this move of God in our heart. This, this, this grace move. Be strong in that. Don't be strong in yourself. What happens when you're strong in yourself? Well, you eventually fail. Maybe you haven't understood that to live the Christian life is an absolute impossibility without the grace of God. Only way it's possible to live for Jesus is the grace of God. You can pull yourself up by your bootstraps, have the best attitude, put on your best intentions, and still fall flat on your face. Because you don't live this life by the power of self. You live by the power of the Holy Spirit. And what is that working of the power of the Holy Spirit called in your life? Grace. It's the grace of God. So Paul's telling Timothy, be strong in grace. First Timothy writes him again in this letter. And he says, verse 12, 14, chapter 1, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. Now listen to this. God called me and put me in service. He said, but before... I was a blasphemer. And before, I was a persecutor. And before, I was a violent aggressor. 
Before what? Before grace. I was all these things before grace. He said, but I was shown mercy because I was acting ignorantly in my unbelief. I didn't believe God. I chose to live what I own live. And the grace of our Lord Jesus, says verse 14, was more than abundant with faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. The grace of God was more than abundant. In other words, he says, God called me to ministry. That's the first thing he says, right? God put me in the ministry. What qualified me? Where, where's my, where's my uh, resume? Let's pull it up. Here's your resume. You were a blasphemer. You had a dirty mouth, a dirty life. Excuse me, I called you to ministry. Yeah, let me read your resume again. You were a persecutor. And yet you're in the ministry? You were, <laughs> you were acting stupidly and ignorantly in your unbelief. That's his resume. That's not much of a resume, is it? But here's the bottom line of the resume. God showed me grace. Amen. I received the grace in faith. I trusted the grace. I trusted God's mercy. I, I trusted what God did for me. I believed the grace of God. And with faith and love that are found in Christ Jesus, what happens is grace showed me how stupid I was, how ignorant I was, how I lived my life beforehand. And I came to Jesus and grace opened my eyes. Grace called me to the cross. God applied the cross to my life. That was grace at work in my life. Now I'm serving the Lord by the grace of God. That which saved me is now which that which strengthens me. That which saved me is that which now gives me the ability to live a brand new life. A lot of people tell you that all the time. Well, I want to be a Christian, but I can't live it. No, you can't. But grace in your life will cause you to live it. Grace in your life will cause you to live it. But choices have to be made, obviously. You know, I guess that what we need is a good definition for grace today. Now, the best one I found was over in the Strong's Lexicon, all right? It's, a, it's an enhanced Strong's Lexicon. It's a, it's a dictionary for Greek words. The, go to the next slide. The Greek word is in, in, for grace is the word charis. It's the word we get charisma from and charismatic from. But listen to this, 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 this definition. Grace is merciful kindness by which God, exerting his holy influence upon souls, turns them to Christ. And he keeps and he strengthens and he increases them in Christian faith, knowledge, affection, and kindles them to exercise, to the exercise of Christian values. Now, I mean, just pause for a moment. Think about this. It, it, remember that grace, this word charis in the, in the Greek language is a, is a power word. In other words, yeah, it's a noun, but it's a noun which represents action and activity and, 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 and a movement. The best word here is influence. Grace is when God influences my life. He influenced my life and showed me I was going to hell. He influenced my life and showed me how empty I was. He influenced my life by opening my eyes to see that Jesus died for my sins. All that influence and conviction and work, is that's grace. All right? And he says, it's the holy influence which, by, which God exerts that influence upon my life. And I love it when it puts it this way. It, it turns them to Christ. All right? Turns them to Christ. Keeps strengthens, increases them in Christian faith, in knowledge and affection, kindles them to the exercising of Christian values. In other words, how do I live this life based upon a new set of values, which are Christian godly values, instead of living the way I've always lived? Grace. And God, you say, where do I get grace? It comes from God. And it's this offering that God gives to, to, to move in your heart and move in your life and give you the power to serve him, to live for him, to grow in him, to be secure in him, to be kept in him. All that's grace. So any action ultimately that God is doing in you, for you and with you, it's grace. It's grace. Paul said, God put me in the ministry. Well, you saw my resume, so it's grace. <laughs> Blasphemer, ignorant, accuser, you know, violent aggressor, grace. I am what he says later on. I am what I am by the grace of God. In other words, I, I can't claim any, any integrity of my own. It's all the grace of God. So let me put it even in a simpler nutshell. There's really no excuse for us not living godly lives. Oh, but Brother Joe, you don't know how I was brought up or you don't know my circumstances. Or you don't know the things I've had to deal with in my life. You don't, no, 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 no. Not according to what grace has done and what God does through grace for us. There's no excuse for us not serving the Lord. There's no excuse for us not genuinely living for the Lord. You can't say, I'm just too young. I'm not strong enough Christian. No, I can't say that. Why? Because grace 
strengthens me. You can't say, well, I, I just, I don't have the personality for it. It doesn't have anything to do with personality because grace changes me. You can't say, well, I, I just don't have courage, you know, as, as a Christian to stand up and be bold and live that kind of, nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with God has done something for you. Yes, you have to make a choice. You, you're going to have to get desperate. You're going to have to call on him. You're going to have to trust him. You're going to have to believe him. And away with this little petty thing says, well, I just don't deserve it. No, you deserve to go to hell. You got what you deserved. You wouldn't be sitting here in an air-conditioned building today. The temperature would be a lot different. <laughs> Amen? If you got what you deserved, you'd be, listen, I told one day, so, uh, this, I said, listen, if I got what I deserved, I'd be either dead in jail or hell. That's what I deserve. That's what Paul was saying. But for the grace of God. Hebrews 4, 6, 16 says, Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy to find grace to help in time of need. You have a need? I have a need for a renewed life. I have a need for a strengthened life. I have a need for a transformed life. I have a need for a kind of living that I can't do, but he can. I need what I need. I need to approach the throne of grace. I need to get right with God. I need to get honest with God. I need to quit covering up. I need to quit, you know, justifying myself and rationalizing what I've done. I just need to say, God, I, I messed up. I, like Paul says, I messed up. Here's what I was. And you won't ever just, if you just, if you can't come to that, if you're still busy trying, well, I'm okay. If you're going to live that life, I'm okay. You're, you'll never be okay. It's just not going to happen. But what grace does, it brings salvation, changes, draws, convicts you, and then transforms you for the service for living for Jesus Christ. Now, I sent this uh, uh, PowerPoint out the, the other day. To, so I was trying to, when I got back from Belize, trying to put this, this message together. And I wish I'd spend a little more time with the alliteration because it came to an even better alliteration for this morning. So there's grace for salvation and there's grace that, that's for serving unmerited favor, unmerited strength. But there's another grace to help in times of difficulty and weakness. And what I should have titled that is you have grace for salvation, grace for serving, but you also have grace for help with weakness and difficulties. It could have been grace for suffering. In 2 Corinthians, that passage in 12, where Paul's talking about his thorn in the flesh, it says, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, in other words, God showed me a lot of stuff, but to keep me from exalting myself or what I've been, been shown, he says, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Now, the four observations, I'm going to give it to you real quick. It's in that next slide. This, he says, here's this thorn, and he talks about all this, this problem that he's having and this, 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 this difficulty in his life. And, and what the scripture tells you, the thorn, first of all, was, he says, was given to prevent pride in my life. There's, this, there's a problem in my life. There's a, there's a trial that I'm facing. There's a temptation maybe I have to deal with every day of my life on some level. But it's there to keep me from being exalted, getting puffed up, thinking that I've really achieved something. It reveals to me every day how much I need Jesus. It shows me every day how much I need to call on him. Now, the second thing I want you to catch about this, this problem was inflicted by God himself, all right? God sent, God sent this issue. God allowed the devil to inflict Paul with this problem. Why? So Paul, one, become arrogant, and number two, he learned how to trust in the power of God to overcome. See, there's a lot of our Christian life that we just overcome by our strength. I mean, we just do it. We just, we just struggle through it, and we, we try, and we, we get by a little bit, all right? But to really fully live the Christian life, that doesn't last long. That, that motor burns out real fast and that tank dries up, all right? You just can't live it by yourself. That'll last you for a few days. Some people go for a few years, putting on a real good show outwardly, but inside they're just a wreck. And behind the scenes in the darkness of their life where nobody sees and the veil's been, been pulled up close and nobody looks in, they're living a different kind of life. That's a miserable way to live your life. Paul said, listen, it doesn't have to be that. God, God, will, give you, God will give you what you need, even in those crisis moments. Even the difficult times, even in the great temptation that seems to be occurring over, you don't have to succumb to that. God will give you grace. But it's there to show you that, hey, I can trust God. And God is powerful. And God will give me, he, well, let's go back to that definition. He will influence my life in such a way that influence in my life, I'll make right choices and decisions. By the way, something's always influencing our life one way or the other, is it not? 
We're influenced by people. We're influenced by our environment. We're influenced by our family. We're influenced by the people I work with. I'm influenced by all kinds of things in my life. If I let those things influence my life, I'll, I'll miss the grace of God. Or I will turn away from those things and turn to the Lord and say, hey, Lord, if it does take something, if it does take a circumstance, a situation in my life to keep me humble, to keep me trusting, then I'll glory in that because that's where I want to be. I really want to live for you. I really want to trust you in my life. The third thing he says about this, this thorn, he says it, 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 it was meant to, you know, to torment Paul. You know, he said it, it, was, it, it, was, it, it, it was meant to get his attention, to, to buffet him in some way. That's the same word that's used, this word torment, as the suffering of Christ as it's described in, in the New Testament at the crucifixion. I'm suffering here. This hurts. This is an easy issue to deal with. The fourth thing about it is this. I asked God three times to take it away. It didn't go away. In other words, I prayed. I prayed God take it away. He didn't take it away. God, I don't want to deal with this. I don't like this temptation. I keep falling. No, then, all right, then quit falling in it and realize that, hey, it is there and it's genuine, but so is the grace of God. So is the power of God. So is the presence of God. So is the Holy Spirit in your life. He's there too. And he can bring as much and more influence as that other thing should you make the right willing choice in your life to say, hey, I will choose to believe God's grace here. It's not any different for, for you than, than it is for Paul. Do you think somehow that you're, you're a better uh, saint than Paul? That you're not going to have to go through crisis and turmoils and situations or temptations? You know, God doesn't tempt you, but he will with every temptation give you a way of escape. That's grace. Yes. Amen. But he will allow situations in your life just as he did in the life of Job. This, this, the promise of, of this passage in, in where, where Paul's talking about his thorn is the beauty that God's grace is bigger than those things and God's grace can influence you to have victory even when you're having to deal with things in your life. Where do we ever get the idea that, it, that, that if I'm going to be a really sold out Christian, there's not going to be problems? Well, that's a lie out of hell. Yeah. I, I kind of thought that as a young Christian, well, I'm going to get real spiritual one day, I'm going to have all these problems. The more spiritual you get, the more problems you get. Why? Because you can handle them. <laughs> You can deal with it. You can take it. Bring it on. You can handle it. Why? Because of the grace of God. Let me read you from the Amplified, that verse 7 through 9, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 12. The Amplified puts away. Paul says, And to keep me from being puffed up and too much elated by the exceeding greatness and preeminence of these revelations, you know, having all this information from God and revelation, he said, There was given me a thorn, a splinter in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to rack and buffet and harass me. Anybody have any of those occasionally? I got them all the time. Just something to harass you, all right? But he said, but keeps me from being excessively exalted. Three times I called upon the Lord and besought him about this. I begged that it might depart from me. But God said to me, my grace, my favor, my loving kindness and mercy is enough for you, sufficient against any danger and enables you to bear the trouble manfully. In other words, I don't have to be a little girl about this. <laughs> For you gentlemen, you'll understand what I'm talking about, all right? For my strength and my power are made perfect, fulfilled and completed and show themselves most effective in your weakness. Listen to what he says. Therefore, I will more gladly glory in my weakness and my infirmities that the strength and the power of Christ the Messiah may rest, may pitch a tent over me and dwell upon me. His response is, I will glory. Verse 12, 10 it puts it this way. So for the sake of Christ, I am well pleased and take pleasure in these infirmities and in these insults and in these hardships and in these persecutions and in these distresses and in these perplexities. For when I'm weak in this human strength, I'm truly strong and able and powerful in divine strength. That's the grace of God. That's the grace of God. The grace for living the Christian life. The grace during suffering, the grace during trials, the grace during difficulties. I don't, I don't know where you're at today. I, you know, I know some of you think I peak. <laughs> yeah, I don't even read your Facebook post, all right? <laughs> Which occasionally Kathy will read them to me. <laughs> and I'd be embarrassed if I were you to put that out in public. <laughs> hey, but God knows right where you're at. He knows what's going on. He knows what you're dealing with. He knows what trials you're facing. He knows what temptations you're in. And not a one of them is bigger than you Amen. in him, in his strength and by his grace. And will with every one of them, with every one of them, if you'll allow him, 
He will influence your life with the power you need to get through it. That's called grace. So we get a little bigger idea about grace being just, well, this unmerited favor. All right? It goes beyond that. The last one here is this. It's grace that, that literally guides us. It steers our life. All right? And as he steers our life with grace, it's amazing all we learn. Catch this. And this is where many people fail the grace of God. Titus 2.11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny godliness, worldly desires, to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Can I just read that one more time? The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Now, this is important because there's, to, to, to prove my point about how a lot of people do not understand grace, they look at it like this. Hey, I'm a Christian. I'm under grace. I can do whatever I want to do. You know, all things are lawful for me. That's what the Bible says. Now, read the second part. It says, but not all things are expedient. You know, not a thing I do is going to send me to hell because I'm safe in the grace of God. But I'll tell you what, if I choose to live the way I want to live, that grace that influences blessing will also influence me with chastening. Ultimately, condemnation of my flesh. God will literally touch my flesh, touch my health, and touch my body if I won't listen to him. Grace is this supernatural blessing that God works in our life through the influence of his word and his Holy Spirit and how he imposes that influence upon our life that if I respond to it, I can experience his grace in my life. It's the Greek word here for when he says he instructs us, the grace of God instructs us. It's the Greek word paduo, which we get the word for discipline even from and, and for teaching and for instruction. And he says, one thing about grace is that it's going to teach you something. Say, I'm under grace, all right? Then you're going to, you've learned something. Well, what have I learned? Because <laughs> a lot of people who say they're under grace, they haven't learned a thing. They're still living the way they used to live before the cross. They still do what they want to do when they want to do it. They still act how they want to act whenever they want to act that way. They still talk how they want to talk whenever they talk that way. And the grace of God hadn't taught them a thing because they're not teachable. You can't instruct them. But all the time, grace is there and the God is moving our life to instruct us. He says, and here's the, here's the simple instruction. He gives. It's a couple of denies and a three lives, all right? He says, one, here's what God's grace has taught me. It teaches me to deny ungodliness. Now, this is, this is important for those people who say, I'm under grace, I can do whatever I want to do. If I'm really under grace, I'm getting instruction, and that grace will say, don't do anything that's not like God. Amen. All right, pretty simple input. Got that? What's grace taught me today? That's ungodly. Grace shows me that's ungodly. Grace reveals that's ungodly. If I choose to live that way, that's ungodly. That's not like God. It's not like Jesus. It's not like his word. It's not like his personality. It's not like his character. It's not like the Holy Spirit. It's just not God. Well, how do I know it's not God? Grace shows me that. There's a lot of people living ungodly lives. I'm under grace. No, they're not under grace. They've heard about grace. They talked about grace. They sang the Amazing Grace song. But they hadn't learned anything. The second thing is it also teaches me to reject worldly desires. Now, that, to, that word desire is a word that's used a lot in Scripture. It's the word epithumia. It translates lust 31 times in Scripture. Worldly lust, worldly desires, things that just satisfy my flesh, whether it's immorality and fornication, homosexuality, whatever it might be out there. God says, hey, one of my grace teaches you to deny that. My grace will teach you that, you, that that's not the way to go. You know, that's, that's, that's not what, it's, it teaches me to deny worldly desires. What are worldly desires? Well, you've got two realms you can live in. You, you live in godly or you live in worldly. You, you, it's the wisdom of the world, the wisdom of God. Which, which one are you going to go? What grace does, it teaches me what the wisdom of God is. So I, did, I take the wisdom of the world and I just smart I really think I am and, and, and push it aside. It's the desire, the craving, the longing for what God says don't do. So you can't use this. Well, I'm under grace and do whatever I want to do. No, you can't. There's no, that doesn't teach that in the Bible. It says it may be lawful, but it's not expedient. Now, now, here's what God says. Don't, 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 don't. Don't you love this? There's two don'ts and three do's here, by the way. And the two don'ts are pretty obviously don'ts, but the, but the way the do's are listed, they're listed as live. God's grace teaches you how to live. You want to live? Listen to grace. You want to enjoy life? Listen to grace. You want the fullness of life? Quit listening to those things over here. Deny, say no, turn your back on it. 
But, but this is what we've always called the principle of replacement, right? God never calls me from something. He didn't call me to something. All right? You know, when I got saved, I, I, I've been in a, in a relationship with a girl. I'm not surprised at somebody, you know, that somebody like me could have a girlfriend, all right? But God made very clear that that wasn't going to work. Grace instructed me. That's a bad deal, son. She doesn't love Jesus. She's not interested in things of God. This is not going to work in any way. So I had to have that little heart-to-heart -heart meeting. Uh, this ain't going to work. You know? But guess what? God called me from that to something far better. It's a little girl named Kathy. And, 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 and 40 years later, we're still enjoying life. Yeah. You know, I just can't, I can live without that girl. Oh, you can. Real easy. <laughs> it's no problem. You're going to make it. All right. You didn't need her. You don't need him. Whatever it is, you'll be all right. God's got something. It's that replacement. God doesn't call you from something. He doesn't give you something far better. So, and that's what, so here we get to this live part. And he says, he says three things here. He says, first of all, he teaches us how to live how? Sensibly. That's the word sober-minded. Sofren in the Greek language. Safe thinking. In other words, grace teaches me not to be stupid. How many of y'all done some really stupid things in your life? Oh, come on, raise your hand. I've done some really stupid things in my life. I'm waiting for the rest of you. Come on. <laughs> I mean, you've done some really dumb stuff. I mean, really bad decisions, right? I mean, you've walked away from nothing. Oh, what an idiot I was, you know? And then you thank God that maybe nobody else saw you do it or whatever it might be. But it was stupid, you know? But grace teaches you how to live sensibly, not to live stupid life. Made up a stupid mistake after stupid mistake after stupid mistake. I mean, I've said people can say, no, Brother Joe, can you help me? Well, what do you need? Can you get me out of jail? What are you doing in jail, stupid? <laughs> My wife threw me out of the house yesterday. Why, how'd that happen, stupid? Yeah. I know, that's why we let Brother Tim do most of the counseling. <laughs> <laughs> a little more tender heart. <laughs> we, we just do stupid stuff and we want to blame our wife or our kids or our job or our boss, our environment, our upbringing. Hey, you're just stupid on your own, okay? We don't need any help in this department. But here's what God does. He gives us grace so we don't have to live that life that just, it doesn't make any sense. Some of the things you may be doing right now, they don't make any sense. I know they do to you, but it's stupid. It doesn't make any sense for you to keep doing what you're doing because it keeps bringing you back to the same stupid place. <laughs> so what, I need to listen to grace because grace will instruct me how to be sensible. But he goes on to say, not just to be sensible, it's grace that gives me instruction in, in, in the context of living righteously, living for the glory of God, having a life that means something. And really this righteousness has to do as much with my relationship to him as how, how I can really love God. I can really experience what real fellowship is. Maybe you don't know. Listen, listen, listen real carefully. I'm wrapping this up fast. That's why I'm talking 10 times faster than normal. God really likes you. I know it's hard to believe. I've had that trouble in my past too. All right? But God really does. He, he loves you. And God really, 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 as my granddaughter says, really, 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 really wants to fellowship with you to be a father to you, to provide for you, to protect you from being stupid. But you have to listen to the instruction of grace. So you know how to live that kind of way and walk in that kind of fellowship. He teaches us how to live sensibly and righteously and godly in this present age. And that's important because the present age we live in is a wicked age. Everybody's doing everything. People shacking up. People living incredibly immoral lives. We're living in a day when the Supreme Court of the United States is deciding if the biblical definition of marriage is what we want to live by. That's a godless age, all right? It's just a godless time we're living in. But the grace of God will instruct my life. If I let, him, if I let God influence my life, he'll teach me how to live in the righteous life. 1 Corinthians 15, 10 says, By the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me did not prove vain. 
His grace didn't prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God. Now, for those people who don't understand grace, that verse is kind of contradictory. Because he says, I am by the grace of God, but I worked harder than everybody else. You know, people say, well, you don't have to work for righteousness. You don't have to work for yourself. You don't have to work for that. Paul says, I work, 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 work. Or anybody else around me. But I am what I am. Not because I did all that. I am what I am by the grace of God. But here's what happens. When we let grace instruct us, then we want to do something for God. We want to express our love for Jesus. We want to express our, our desire for, for, for and appreciation for the sacrifice of the cross, for his blood that was shed. The Bible says don't receive the grace of God in vain. What's that mean? That means that you say, oh yeah, thank you, Jesus, I take it. But your life's not changed. Grace has no effect upon your life. That's, that's, not, that's, not, that's not the lesson of Scripture. It says grace of God will be with you. We don't use the grace of God as an excuse for our sin, to live the way we want to live. It's true grace empowers us. True grace enforces us. True grace deepens us. So we have people who are people of commitment and people of integrity, people of character. Their lives are different because of the grace of God's working in them. We say, Brother Joe, I, I, I need the grace of God in my life. Let me show you how the Bible teaches we have grace. Pretty simple. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he'll, he'll lift you up. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble, Scripture says. You have yourself before God. If there's sin in your life, you've got to get it right. You can't justify anymore. You can't say, oh, I don't do what I used to do. <laughs> so what? You know? I don't do what I used to do. But what I'm doing is still not right. It doesn't justify anything. It means you're just still wrong on a different level, but you're still wrong. And, and you, you, can't, you can't justify it by saying, oh, man, well, look what everybody else is doing. And they call themselves Christians, so I'm going to do it. No, that's, that's ignorance too. That's stupid living. I had to confess. What does it mean? When's the last time you got honest and really admitted to God, God, you're right and I'm wrong. And the way I'm living is wrong. What I've said is wrong. What I've done is wrong. The way I've behaved is wrong. The way I've treated others, it's wrong. I can't use an excuse. Well, they did this. They, no, that's all out the window now. The grace of God says, if I humble myself, God will influence my life in a righteous way, in a real way, in a genuine way, make my life different. You confess any sin, and then you confess his sufficiency. That means that I'll come to his throne of grace and I'll confidently walk away from saying, I have what I need. But Brother Joe, what if I don't feel anything? It doesn't matter. This is what matters. He said it, that settles it. If I tell Kathy, you know, here's a gift card, there's $100 on it, go spend it on what you want to. She can't sit back and say, how do I know it's really $100 on here? <laughs> what if I get out there and use it and I'm embarrassed because there's only $10 on it? She says, take my word for it, doesn't she? And she will. And she does. <laughs> and God tells you, you ask, you receive, you trust me when you walk away, but it's there. You can't get out here and say, okay, thank you, Lord, for that. I have grace to live it. And say, oh, I don't want to do that. Or this is too hard. That's too difficult. I don't know if I can. No, that's, that's not confidence. That's not faith. That's not trust. You just move forward. You wave that card, swipe it, whatever you need to do. And you believe God's grace. You just step out in faith. There's one thing that you have got to learn and one thing that grace will instruct you in is this. You have what you need when you need it, when you have him. You have everything you need when you need it, when you have him. Will you step out and follow him? Or will you continue to live that stupid life? Let's stand with our heads bowed.